Um, sorry, I started before the recording, so I'll start again. Uh, hi, everybody. It is my immense pleasure to be here and uh, extremely excited for this webinar. I am a co-chair of the AI and Medicine Initiative at Sick Kids, together with Dr. Jai Mazwi. My background is in AI, and I'm thrilled to have you all on this uh, uh, on this call and on this webinar and uh, looking forward to explain for kids. And uh, here's to Melissa. Thank you so much, Anna. So welcome everybody. I'm Melissa McFadden. I am the John and Melinda Thompson Director of AI and Medicine, where I lead the integration arm of the AIM initiative. Uh, so part of my role is to develop uh, guidance for the hospital as to how we will do AI here at SickKids. And today I'm joined by some colleagues where we're going to be talking to you about health data, about AI, and about the importance of engaging children and youth. So I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement uh, by acknowledging the land on which Sick Kids operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat and Petun First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, Toronto is home to indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. Sick Kids is committed to working toward new relationships that include First Nations, Inuit and Métis people, and is grateful for the opportunity to share this land in caring for children and their families. For the Adelaide acknowledgement, I will turn over to Rachel. Thank you, Melissa. So from Adelaide, <clears throat> we acknowledge and pay our respects to the Ghana people, the traditional custodians whose ancestral lands our university and our women's and children's hospital are on. We acknowledge the deep feelings of attachment and relationship of the Ghana people to country, and we respect and value their past, present, and ongoing connection to the land and cultural beliefs. Thanks. Thank you, Rachel. So our agenda for tonight uh, will consist of three presentations. The first will be Dr. Alistair Johnson speaking about the value of health data. The second from Dr. Lauren Oakton Rayner speaking about AI and clinical research. Search. And finally, you're here from me, uh, as well as my project coordinator, Kelly Tai, and Dr. Rachel Roberts, talking about engaging children and youth in AI and healthcare. And with that, I'll first turn it over to Dr. Alistair Johnson. Uh, Dr. Johnson is a scientist with the Child Health and Evaluative Sciences Program at Sick Kids Hospital in the Research Institute. Thank you, Alistair. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. So yeah, I'll chat a little bit about using health data for, for research. It's something that uh, I'm very passionate about, and hopefully I can share a bit of that enthusiasm with you. If we sort of zoom all the way back, uh, we, can, we can trace some of the history of using health data to, to improve public health back to 1854, where there was a cholera outbreak in, in London and a physician named John Snow uh, actually mapped out the location of all the instances of cholera and interviewed uh, all the all these uh, individuals who who had who had cholera and ended up it's a little bit hard to see on this map this is his original map identifying all the cases but if we overlay it on a more modern view of 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 London what he found actually was that there was a common source of a water pump that was nearby. Back then, everybody thought that cholera was caused by bad air. They called it uh, miasma or miasma. And he was actually able to show through data that no, there's this common cause, uh, which is the water pump. He actually removed the handle from the water pump so people couldn't use it anymore. And all the cholera cases basically disappeared. So. Uh, a very, very old uh, version of, of using data for, for improving health and, and actually uh, some consider one of the first cases of, of epidemiology in general. Uh, so clearly there's a lot of potential use of, of, of healthcare data and, and it's only grown in terms of the types of data that we collect and, and, and the capabilities. Um, and so clearly we have this sort of strong desire. If we 
go a bit into more recent history in the, in the 1990s, the Massachusetts Group Insurance Commission, um, which was a, a health insurance provider in the United States, they actually released a data set of hospitalizations and, and procedures and laboratory tests all for, for patients who they, they insured. And the goal of this data set that they released to, to the sort of general public or researchers was to support healthcare research, was to follow along with this general idea of we can use uh, observational data to improve the uh, care of patients, to improve their well being. So that was great, and that, that was a fantastic initiative. Um, later on, after this data set had been released, Massachusetts Governor Weld in, in, in 1996 was actually giving. Uh, was at an honorary degree ceremony when he unfortunately collapsed, as you can see, um, which was uh, uh, pretty scary at the time. So he was just dehydrated. Uh, it was a very hot day, as we can all relate to in Toronto. You, you need to make sure to drink your fluids. So he, he was fine, but the Boston Globe, this was sort of a big deal. So the Boston Globe reported on, on what happened. They said, oh, um, uh, Governor Weld you know, went to the hospital, he had an electrocardiogram done, he had a blood enzyme test, and he had an echocardiogram. And what a computer science student at, uh, at MIT at the time did, Latanya Sweeney, is she actually was able to use this information, some information from another database, to cross-reference uh, with the published uh, Massachusetts Group Insurance uh, database and figure out who Governor Weld was, even though they had removed names and identifiers and whatnot. So this was what's classically called a re-identification attack, where despite the creators of the data set removing the information, uh, identifying an individual, there was still a unique attribute which could be used in order to, to identify them. So Latanya Sweeney actually sent uh, Governor Weld's medical records to his office, and uh, clearly, if you um, uh, if you are uh, you know, an, anyone, I think you are not very comfortable with some random computer science student at MIT mailing you your me sensitive medical records. So this was this was a, a really really big deal and and a, a learning experience for I think everyone in the world. And how the United States actually ended up reacting to this was they they. Uh, well, I won't say it was entirely the cause of, of this uh, act, but they created this Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act where they started to specify what you are and aren't allowed to do with health data. And in particular, there was a safe harbor provision which talked about this specific use case of when you have a research data set and you would like to use it to improve public health, how do you actually protect the individuals for, for whom the data pertain? Well, there's a few good steps to do. You remove their names, which had already done, which had already been done with the Massachusetts GIC data set. But in addition to that, they said, well, you actually need to remove the date that a procedure happened because that was used in that re-identification attack. You need to remove other identifiers. You need to remove IP addresses. You need to remove uh, various aspects like that. Uh, zip code, so, so where the person lives, you need to remove that. that, that can't be included. And what HIPAA ended up doing is creating this definition of, of, de of what we call de-identification, um, which was very, very effective actually. It substantially reduced the, the risk of an individual being re-identified. Governor Weld would not have been able to be re-identified had they followed the procedures uh, set out in, in the safe harbor provision. So this was a, was a very good and, and, and effective piece of legislation that substantially reduced the risk to individuals in research data sets, while at the same time allowing researchers to actually use this data to, to improve public health. And so if we switch over to Canada, we had our own version of, of HIPAA called PHIPAA, which I believe was first passed in, in 2004, uh, which largely uh, aimed to accomplish the same aims where, okay, we were interested in using health data. It actually pertained to all health data managed by, by, uh, by the healthcare system. But if we focus specifically on our little area of using it for research, it had some provisions on what are the rules around using healthcare data for research to sort of improve public health in general. And those rules are pretty straightforward and, and they make sense. Um, there's the general guidance specifically in, in the legislation. Um, they talk, uh, uh, they 
talk about how you need a research ethics board in order to in order to do a research study so there needs to be some sort of ethics review process when you're first proposing your study where you outline what you're doing and and a set of experts will actually review it and consider okay is the data appropriate is are all the appropriate protections in place and and so on and so forth and some of the some of the factors which they consider when they are doing this are are um are you only using the information that you need so if you're doing a research study uh, most of the time there's only a subset of information that you would actually be interested in and so it's good practice and actually this is what the research ethics board help uh, uh, check for and, and, and enforce is that you are only using the information you need so if you do not need uh, if you do not need the home address of the individual then you're not you're not being provided with it you're not requesting it and that makes sense you should only really use the data that is actually pertinent to your to your research study there are requirements around actually making sure that the the data are, are sort of technically secured so uh, are you storing it behind a locked door are you encrypting the data uh, which is which is uh, very important nowadays are you actually sort of having good governance over the physical and and, and technical location of the data and then only specific individuals are allowed access. So when you're work, doing research with this particular data set or, or, or with whatever data sets in question, you're not granting it to everyone in the world. Everyone who uh, is using the data set has a good reason to use the data set that makes sense and that is minimizing the risk to the individuals while still allowing for us to improve the health of, of everyone. So we've learned a lot from just the general uses of health data, I would say, uh, especially over the last uh, sort of two decades in, in people trying to do research with data in, and in particular, uh, people trying to figure out, well, you know, what are people's general perceptions about healthcare research and what situations uh, is it okay and what situations is it not okay? You know, what can we learn from, you know, past mistakes or past successes? And what we've sort of learned over the last two decades, I think it's um, uh, not very controversial to say is almost, at least almost every adult thinks that we should be doing this, that if we are collecting uh, clinical data, routine observational data, and there's a potential for us to improve the health of, of everyone with this data, then, then we should be doing it. We should, we should be trying to improve the health of, of everyone in, in the world and everyone in Ontario's. And so in, in various studies which ask uh, which ask individuals, hey, what do you think about us doing research for, for the public benefit? Almost a, a, every a, adult says, yes, we're, we're completely for it. Uh, sometimes there are reservations. And typically when there's a discussion about those reservations and the actual caveats of it, most people understand, oh, okay, now that I understand how you're handling the data and now that I understand how you're, how, uh, all the protections in place to do this research, I, I feel a lot more comfortable about it. So, so that's great. And that sort of follows into the second point of that we we sort of know how to protect patient privacy when working with these data sets. We've had these structures in place for 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 managing uh, research data sets and managing health data sets and who's allowed access and how they're allowed access and how we uh, reduce the risk to individuals that are extremely effective. Uh, it, in uh, one study, they actually found that if you calculate the risk of re-identifying an individual in a data set, it's actually lower than the risk of being struck by lightning. So we are getting very good at, uh, at uh, protecting patient privacy in, in certain contexts and our processes in place, they, they work and, and they're very effective. And the third point, which I think is kind of obvious to anyone who's attending uh, this lecture and, and hopefully uh, a much broader audience is that, you know, a lot of us are very excited about the potential of health data, about being able to learn from this massive collective experience of, you know, an entire hospital or an entire health system. It's something that you can't imagine an individual doing because you can't experience every possible event in a, in a health system. But through data analysis and through some of the more sophisticated machine learning and artificial intelligence methods, we actually have an opportunity to synthesize all this knowledge that's sort of buried in, in data and, and actually use that knowledge to, to support patient care. So everybody is really excited about uh, potentially using data in, uh, to, to, in this way to support uh, patient care. 
but there are things that we we don't really know and 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 i hope this is kind of uh, jogging uh, your your thoughts and and making you think a bit about what are the sort of questions that that you should be asking first is we don't really know what you think most if not i want to say all studies uh have focused on uh, adult perspectives so we really don't understand a lot of the nuances that that happen with pediatric data sets in particular uh, what are the perspectives of youth around using this data? What happens uh, during some of those turning points when somebody uh, turns uh, is initially a, a child in the data set and then turns 18, turns 20, reaches some age which is considered an age of maturity? So we don't really understand a lot of the context around that. Um, particularly, there are a few cases in pediatrics which are a little bit tricky. So there tend to be diseases which are very unique to the individual. And if something is very unique to you, then potentially it can be used to, to identify who you are. So we're not really sure how to handle this situation because on the one hand, we want to improve your health, right? We want to use the, use the data that we have uh, to improve your health, but it's just much harder to protect your privacy if you have a unique disease. So we have a, a, a different calculation that we're doing with risk and benefit in that situation. And we actually don't understand the calculus uh, and, and, how, and how that works right now. Um, we're starting to realize that you know, one hospital tends to not have enough data really to, to learn for a, lot of for a lot of individuals and a lot of disease profiles. So we would like to share data across hospitals in order to enable uh, research in order to really have robust data analyses, which are able to make conclusions that we can really use in, in clinical practice. But we're not sure if that's okay. I mean, you can imagine if the hospital that you you go to visit that runs tests on you, if they're using your data to improve uh, their care, you know, that sort of makes sense. But is it okay if you know a hospital across the country is also using your data? That's a question that hasn't really been answered and hasn't really been thought about. And then the uh, the, the last point that I put here is is how much do you actually want to know? Do you want to know about every little study that we're doing in the hospital? Do you want to know about all the uh, uh, small little efficiencies that we are trying to gain? Do you want to know about the really big major research studies that might uh, use a, a lot of health data, a lot of information about you? Where do we draw that line towards telling you too much about all the uh, all the quality improvement initiatives that might be happening in the hospital just to just to make it better, make it provide better care versus the actual research questions where we're not sure what the answer is, but we're investigating. So where do we draw that line in, in telling you enough that you feel like we're keeping you involved and, and we're, we're being transparent about sort of our activities, but we're not overloading you with information. So that's something that we're, we're sort of not sure about as well. And of course, there might be other things that we don't know about using health data that we should know. And if there are, then feel free to email me them because I will definitely answer the email. I answer too many emails probably, but I would love to hear from you as well if you think there's something that, that we should actually figure out because these are some of the questions that we're asking right now with, with, uh, with Melissa and, and these are the kind of questions that, that we hope we have an answer to in, in the next few years. And with that, I'll say thank you. Thank you so much, Alistair. That was a fabulous presentation. And the reason we talk so much about data is because data is what we use to drive AI at hospitals. And so here to talk a little bit about AI and the role of clinical research is Dr. Lauren Oakden Rayner. Dr. Oakden Rayner is a radiologist and senior research fellow at the Australian Institute for Machine Learning, where her work focuses on medical safety. Take it away, Lauren. Hey, thanks so much, Melissa. Uh, and hi everyone, I'm Lauren. Uh, I'm here to talk to you a bit about artificial intelligence and hopefully to give you a uh, more, more complex view of what AI is. We, we tend to not have a particularly good understanding of what it is and uh, some of the ways we think about it can be a bit uh, biasing and, and uh, difficult to, to relate to practice. So as a as a doctor as well as an AI researcher, hopefully I can give you uh, something more complex. So first thing we'll do is talk about AI itself. And uh, to do this, I'm actually going to go back to 2016. Uh, so back in 2016, we had earlier forms of artificial intelligence technology in medicine, but the, the technology we really call AI today had only started being used in, in the technology space around this time. And we didn't have any systems in, in medical practice. We 
had nothing that had got through the regulators. We didn't even have any large scale medical studies. Uh, but we did have people like Jeffrey Hinton, who's a very famous uh, technology uh, uh, computer science professor, saying that AI was going to take over medicine. Uh, and at this stage, he actually said, within five years, we, we won't need radiologists anymore. Uh, so by 2021, we still had every radiologist practicing. Uh, and obviously that, that prediction was wrong. But uh, this kind of shows the, the expectation around this technology. And it's not really a bad expectation. It was just perhaps a little premature. So when we think about AI, there tends to be a couple of main ways we discuss this technology, particularly in the media. Uh, you see the same thing in medical journals and other forms of discussion around this technology. And the first one is that these systems are catching up, that they're reaching human level performance. They're starting to outperform humans at various tasks, uh, often medical tasks, and uh, that you know this is something very exciting. And, and certainly that's true, that it's exciting. But there is a bit of a problem with this framing of the technology. And it's also a problem with the other framing of technology we often see. We often see this idea that artificial intelligence is actually not very smart, that uh, it, you know, that we'll see things like it can't reason, it doesn't have common sense, it doesn't understand things. And we get these competing explanations. You often hear this being the AI hype explanation and the AI contrarian explanation. Uh, and they're often, you know, very extremely smart people that know what they're talking about. Both of these explanations are true to some extent. But the problem with both of these explanations is each time we're comparing these AI systems to humans, and that leads us to start thinking these systems are human-like. And that, in fact, becomes a problem for our understanding of these systems. So there is a third explanation that sometimes gets talked about. We don't see it very often, but certainly in the last couple of weeks, because of various news stories, we have seen this more. And that's that AI is not like a human. And that is kind of the most important take-home message we can have. In fact, that thinking that it's like a human can be dangerous. And so I'm going to focus a little bit on this idea. And the first thing we have to ask is, well, if it's not like a human, what is it like? We, we hear it solving these human tasks. So what's it actually doing? So there's this field of research, which is really interesting, called comparative psychology. And this is the study of non-human intelligences. Uh, and until very recently, this field only was interested in animal intelligences. So uh, this is a really famous paper from 2015, uh, particularly in radiology circles. It was a pigeon, a set of pigeons that were taught how to do medical tasks. And in fact, they found it only took a couple of days, two or three days to train a pigeon to be as good as a radiologist at detecting breast cancer on mammograms, or as good as a pathologist at detecting cancer on pathology slides. Uh, and obviously, you know, doctors were interested in this, whether you're a radiologist or pathologist, or anyone else who could who could dunk on the radiologists and pathologists, um, but this is you know actually a quite understandable thing that we know pigeons aren't intelligent, but we know they have a very good visual processing system. So we know pigeons can do things like be taught to differentiate the letters of the alphabet. Uh, they can learn to recognize different human facial expressions. They can even differentiate between a Monet and a Picasso if they've been shown uh, examples before. And so pigeons are very good at visual tasks. The reason I bring this example up is that it shows you that you do not have to be intelligent to do really difficult tasks. Uh, you know that a pigeon is not smart. You know that it doesn't think like a human. It doesn't reason like a human. And I actually think this is the way we should be thinking about artificial intelligences. Think if an AI is doing something, well, think that it's a pigeon. What would a pigeon do in that situation? And I'm going to give you a really quick, simple example. This is a mammogram. So this is an X-ray of a breast. And these studies get done to look for breast cancer. And you can see that there's this bright spot down the bottom on the left image, and that is a breast cancer. It's a star-shaped bright mass. Um, and a human looking at this would say it's a cancer. A pigeon that's been trained to do this would say it's a cancer because it's quite an obvious example. But let's take a look at the right image. This is an inverted mammogram. So the, the white spots have been turned to black and the black spots have been turned to white and so on. And a human looks at this and goes, well, I still know this is a mammogram. I know that this looks like breast tissue. I've not seen an inverted one before, but all of the structures look the same to me. And a star-shaped, dense object is going to be a cancer. A pigeon would look at this and go, well, it wouldn't say this, but if you actually had an understanding of its thought process, it doesn't know what a mammogram is. It doesn't know what a breast is. It doesn't know what cancer is. So all it's been taught is to recognize a bright star-shaped object. And now there's a dark star-shaped object. Well, can it detect cancer? And the answer is probably not, or at least 
nowhere near as good as its primary task. So we have to understand that these systems learn patterns, they're pattern recognition systems, but they don't do so with any form of reasoning. They have no knowledge base, they don't understand anything. And so this comparative psychology view is really useful. We know AI systems do this. So I've got a few examples from outside of medicine. There are examples in medicine as well, but uh, you know, these ones are more visually appealing. So here's a system that was trained to detect, uh, to differentiate between wolves and huskies, which is a difficult task because they're quite similar looking canines. And uh, this system, this is its sort of test set. It's looking at trying to, to show that it knows what it's doing. And it gets one case wrong out of the six. It's the one outlined in red. It predicts a wolf and it says a husky. And the task that I give when you know it's an interactive lecture is trying to work out why, why this system got it wrong. And we eventually get to the answer that, well, this is the only husky on a snowy background. And wolves are always photographed on snow. They're very aesthetically pleasing as, as animals that live in the snow. Huskies being pets, they live in urban environments and they're very rarely photographed in snow. And it, when they explored what this network was doing, they found that yes, it was making its decisions entirely based on the background of the image. So it was using this unintended way of solving this problem, which worked within the data set that existed, but if you got data that was slightly different, it would never work. Uh, very similarly, but uh, perhaps even more concerningly, we see something called adversarial attacks. Uh, now, this is a picture of a cat. Very subtle change has been made to this picture that a human cannot even appreciate. And now the AI system is almost certain this is a picture of guacamole, uh, which, you know, very funny, but it really highlights the fact that these AI systems are doing things we don't even understand. We can't appreciate these features. And so they can make mistakes that seem completely nonsensical to us and very inhuman, much more like we think uh, the way a pigeon would reason about things. As I said, there are examples in medicine, but I'll skip those today, very similar to this. This has been formalized in research. Uh, there's this really cool paper called Shortcut Learning and Deep Neural Networks. It's not actually that hard to read. So if anyone's interested, I actually recommend reading it. Um, and they have this summary. There's something called Morgan's Canon in comparative psychology, which essentially says, never assume animals are doing something smart. Always assume that they've somehow found a way to game the system, that they've used some sort of cheap process to solve a task. And they, uh, the researchers here have reproduced this for machine learning. Morgan's Canon for machine learning says, never attribute to high level function what can be explained by using these unintended solutions. Uh, in fact, we should always assume that some unintended solutions are being used and therefore the AI systems will act in ways that are different than humans. So this brings us to our, our main question for what I'm, I'm talking about today, which is, well, what's AI research for and, and why should we be interested? You know, as Alastair said, um, we think there's public good in health data why should we be doing AI research with, with your data? So there's a little technical slide here. I, you don't need to understand the technical details. I'll try and explain it simply, but I'll go back to 1990 and then 2015, just before Jeffrey Hinton said his thing uh, about radiologists being obsolete. In, 19, in the 1990s, a technology that is kind of an earlier form of artificial intelligence started getting investigated. This was called computer-aided detection. It was in radiology looking for breast cancer on mammograms. So like our pigeon example, this uh, picture is just <clears throat> a measure of performance. Uh, you don't need to really understand it. Essentially, if the curve is higher and to the left, the performance is better. And uh, you can see here that the dotted line, which is a human observer, in this case, a radiologist, without the computer system, performed worse than the, the, the human observer with the computer system. And this sort of evidence was used to justify the use of this technology for the FDA, the, the Food and Drug Administration in America, and it was put into widespread practice. So by the time we got to 2010, over 90% of mammograms in the US were read with this technology at a cost of billions of dollars, uh, and we thought it was working. However, the year before Jeffrey Hinton said we don't need radiologists anymore because AI was so good, we actually got follow-up data on this technology. So 25 years of follow-up, uh, all of these dots are different clinics. So this isn't an experiment done in a laboratory. This is real world follow-up. Did these patients get cancer or not? And you can see that these lines have flipped. So the black line is without CAD, without the computer system, and the red dashed line is with CAD. In fact, the performance was worse for people who used it, for doctors who used it. And this translates into harm for patients. This translates into harm and potentially, because we're talking about cancer, even death. So 
we had this big disconnect that we thought it was working really well based on our testing, the same testing that's used for AI today. And 25 years later, we found that actually, no, we were doing harm. Uh, so I write a blog about medical technology, about AI, uh, and I like sort of simplifying things in pithy ways. Uh, this is my phrase that I use to sort of uh, explain this problem. That's performance is not outcomes. The performance testing we do prior to putting systems on the market and putting them into practice does not necessarily relate to the, the human outcomes that come out of it. And this is a really big issue because like I say, we have over 300 AI systems now on the market today. They've been cleared by the FDA. They've been put into practice and they've all been justified by the sort of testing that we do, that we did on the left, the old testing from the 1990s. And we don't do clinical follow-up testing at the moment. And the basic problem is this, as sort of said, these systems are not like humans. So we take a population of patients, we run the system on it, and, and the human does the same task, and they get different errors. So the errors here are in, in yellow. Uh, they get the same number of errors. So performance testing looks good. You've got the same number of errors. You've reached human level performance, as all these news articles would say. Uh, but these errors are not equal. In this case, we see we've got blue, gray, and red. These are risk categories. So low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. And in this example, this toy example, the AI has made its errors in the high risk cases. We know the outcomes will be different. Now, there are many ways this problem can present. So for example, this doesn't have to be risk categories. This could be demographic groups. This could be gender. It could be age. It could be race. And we know from research now that AI systems make mistakes like this. They focus their errors in different racial groups. They focus their errors in different risk groups. And that may be one of the main reasons we see different outcomes. So I've been really negative so far. <laughs> I'm not trying to be negative. What I wanna say is there are a couple of types of AI research and they're all really, really important. The first one is what we'd call applied AI research. We build models, we try and do the best testing we can do to understand how they're working and if they work. This is an example from just after Jeffrey Hinton made his statement. So this was early 2017. Uh, and this was a, a system to detect skin cancer. Uh, this uh, made the cover of Nature. It's obviously a huge deal. And this system did work as well as dermatologists at the task of detecting cancer from a photograph. Uh, and you can imagine how important this is. You can imagine how useful a system like this could be. If you could just at home take a, a, a phone, a camera photo of your, of your skin lesion and it would tell you if you've got cancer or not or if you need to go see a doctor about it or not. Uh, that would expand coverage. There's so many places in the world that don't even have doctors. Uh, it would reduce costs because we don't have everyone going to see the doctor when they've got some moles to be checked. Uh, and it would uh, mean we pick up more cancer because a lot of people don't go to the doctor when they need to. So that would be really important. So this sort of applied work where we're trying to build things and check that they're working is really, really useful. The other sort of work that we do and that we need to do more of is what we call medical AI safety research. And this is largely what I work in. And this is a, a piece of work I was involved in, uh, which is the World Clinical Trials Guidelines for Artificial Intelligence, uh, which uh, essentially defines the set of rules you need to follow if you want to test these systems properly. And it says things like, don't expect them to act like humans. Look into the, look into the errors that they're making and see if they're uh, focused in different areas, if they're focused in different sorts of patients. And so this sort of uh, research is also really, really important. And again, we can't do it without health data. So uh, I'm just gonna leave you with a couple of excerpts from these papers, just to sort of highlight again, this kind of, Two, two speed, three speed view of what AI is. So from the Nature paper on dermatology, um, they say that this CNN, which is the AI system, achieves performance on par with experts. So the performance is the same. And then they conclude that this demonstrates that it's as capable as human experts at detecting cancer. And we know from this previous evidence that this is an anthropomorphization. There may be a disconnect here and it may not actually be true. In this case, this system never actually made it into practice, even though it's now been a number of years since this publication. Uh, this is a longer quote. I'm sorry, I, I'll just summarize it here for you. But um, this is uh, an actual, this is a piece of follow-up research that describes uh, the, the guidelines. And they say that, well, error reporting is, is a really useful minimum requirement. 
because it changes our focus from what is the best performance we can achieve to what is the worst mistake the system can make. And if we focus on that, then we align ourselves with what we care about, which is patient outcomes and human safety. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Lauren, for such a fabulous presentation. Uh, so we're gonna turn it now over to what we are exploring with children and youth. Um, so you'll hear from me again, uh, as well as my project coordinator, Kelly Tai, who uh, organizes the Explain for Kids project. Uh, and then we'll talk to uh, Dr. Rachel Roberts, who is a registered psychologist and an associate professor in the Faculty of Health and Medical Sciences at the University of Adelaide. So you've heard this evening about how hospitals can use health data to advance research, to improve human health. You've also heard about how AI can be a great tool for clinicians, but it's important to make sure that it works for patients before we adopt it into care. The focus for us really is how to get the best out of both systems, out of the medical system, out of individual clinicians, and out of a promising technology of AI. So AI is a medical intervention, but it's not really like a stethoscope or an MRI machine or other medical devices, is it? So we hear about AI in the news, on TV, on social media, in movies. We experience AI through apps, through voice assistants like Siri and online shopping, just for a few examples. Now, people can have strong feelings about AI. Some people love it, others are afraid of it. Some people have fear not only of AI, but have historical mistrust with the medical system and with research enterprises. And so what we do know is that we as researchers, clinicians, and decision makers in healthcare, we really need to understand people's thoughts, feelings, fears, and hopes about AI. And by doing this, we can use AI in a way that is valued by patients and families by focusing on outcomes. So first, what do we actually know about patients' values for AI? Well, we know what adults think. Some will say that AI will allow faster and more accurate data analysis, and that we'll be able to learn more from data. But at the same time, they worry about privacy, the loss of human touch, and skills declining if we rely too much on AI to do the work. They also say that they want doctors to stay in charge. So most folks feel it's really important that the person who is looking out for them stays in control over what decisions are made for their care and not AI. So that's adults. What about children and youth? We don't know a lot. And lots of research has been done to talk to adults, but not a lot to speak with children and youth. And that's a big gap. Children and youth not only have legitimate interests in health technologies because they're patients too, but young people are also actively shaping the future of how we use technologies, how we engage with technologies. They contribute to new social norms and the etiquette of engaging in technologies. You know how Facebook isn't cool anymore or how Insta is becoming passe? These aren't just teen fads. They tell us important things about how young people want to communicate with each other and how they want to be communicated with. Children and youth also have specific rights under the United Nations Charter of the Rights of the Child, to which both Canada and Australia are signatories. These specific rights for children include the right to have your voice heard in decisions that affect you and the right to get information in the way that you choose. And so this means that what you think about AI, how you think AI should be used and how you wish to get information about AI in healthcare is important. Now, some groups like UNICEF recognize the importance of talking to children and youth about AI and have started organizing workshops around the world, but these don't look specifically at AI in healthcare. So sick kids, Holland Blurview, and researchers from the University of Adelaide are working with patients uh, to try and bridge this gap. And that's why we initiated the Explain for Kids study, where we talked to patients about AI in healthcare to better understand their values. So in the study, we talk about three different stories about young people and AI. The first story is about a patient receiving treatment from their doctor for their depression. And we ask if researchers who do not provide care for patients want their information, what they think the researchers should do. 
In the next story, it takes place in the ICU, and we have a situation where the doctor does not know what is wrong with the patient. And so they want to test out an AI to see if the AI can help the patient, but they don't know if it'll help. In this situation, what would the patient be thinking about when the doctor tells them about the AI tool? What should the patient know to help them make a decision about using the AI? Who could help them make this decision? And in the last story, we ask participants for their thoughts on responsibility and mistakes, human AI interaction, and the significance of the doctor-patient relationship. So here are some of what we heard so far. Participants feel that health data should be used specifically to help people who are unwell. They want to know that if their privacy is protected and their data is not being shared inappropriately, this made them feel more comfortable with health data research. Participants also wanted to know what's happening with their data and to be asked at some point if it's okay to use their data in certain ways. When talking about research that could change their clinical care, participants felt that no matter the age of the child, their preferences should be taken into account. Even when parents might be providing consent on their behalf, they felt it was important to make sure that the child understands what's happening and isn't ignored in the decision-making process. Participants don't want researchers to avoid talking about the risks. As patients, they want to know the risks so they can make an informed decision. And like adults, although they were interested in AI, they felt they all felt that there is something really important about the doctor-patient relationships that cannot be replaced by AI. They want AI to be a tool to help, not a replacement for their doctors and nurses. These perspectives give us really important information that will help guide how we use AI. For example, one tool that our team is working on hopes to identify what low-risk tests a patient might need when they arrive in the emergency department. They can take these tests right away instead of waiting to see a doctor. The doctor could see them after the tests are done. It could help streamline care, but it could also be in tension with the feeling that patients want decisions to be made by doctors and not AI. So we want to figure out how to do this in a way that respects patients' wishes while also helping to reduce their time waiting in the emergency department. Hi from Adelaide. So we're also beginning to look at how AI can be used in our children's health services. So for example, at our children's hospital, there's a project using AI to predict which children will get complications after surgery for appendicitis. So the thinking here is this could lead to changes in who gets closely observed after surgery. And so hospital staff could spend their time with the patients who are most likely to need their help. So as AI is beginning to be used here in Australia, we are also interviewing children and youth here in Adelaide. We really want to understand what our young people's views are on AI and ensure that they're included in decisions about how, how AI is used. We're also interested to see whether the views of young people in Australia are similar or different to Canadian young people. Thanks, Kelly. So today is only our first step. We've hosted this webinar today to try and communicate our plans to you, the community, and we'd love to hear from you. So there will be an evaluation form after this webinar. Please fill it out. Let us know what you liked, what you didn't like, what you want to hear more about, and how. We'll be setting up more opportunities for engagement, and we want to tailor this to your preferences. So finally, we want to express our gratitude to the Dalalana School of Public Health, the Edwin Leong Center for Healthy Children and the Sick Kids Foundation for funding our research study. And lastly, we wanna thank you all for taking a Friday evening for the Canucks or Saturday morning for our Australian friends. Thank you so much for joining. We look forward to more exciting conversations and goodbye for now. Thank you so much.